Welcome everyone to the February 24th uh, City Council work session. Um, welcome to everyone at home and here. We have uh, a couple items on our agenda today and a guest uh, speaker, so we're looking forward to that. I do want to let people know that um, between the work session one and two, we're going to do the motions that uh, Councillor Zelenka has put on the table before you. Okay, so we'll start out as Assistant City Manager. Great, thank you, Mayor. Mm -hmm. And I'm just going to turn it over to Matt McRae. All right, thanks. Mayor, City Council. My name is Matt McRae. You've all met me, I know. I'm the Climate and Energy Analyst for the City of Eugene. Um, for those listening at home, a quick reminder that we um, this is one in a series of conversations about setting greenhouse gas reduction targets for the City of Eugene. We had a December 16th, 2015 session where we talked about the background of the climate science. On February 10th, we talked about the background on the carbon carbon budget concept and then just two days ago on February 22nd we got some more background from Andrew Rice uh, from Portland State University and and you all received a description of the 350 target for Eugene um, we have 45 minutes today the I'm gonna introduce um, Angus Duncan who's gonna be our um, guest presenter he's gonna share uh, information from the state level with you all for about 15 minutes I have a couple of very brief comments after he's done and then we'll save the rest of the time for conversation so to introduce uh, mr. Duncan he's the founding president of the Bonneville environment environmental foundation that supports renewable energy development and watershed res restoration across the Pacific Northwest he worked as um, in private sector in renewable energy project development in state and local government as a member and chair of the Northwest Power Planning Council and as directory director of energy policy for the US Department of Transportation uh, in, in 2004, he chaired the committee that uh, drafted Oregon's first climate change goals and strategy that was then adopted by the government, the governor and legislature. And in 2008, he was appointed to chair Oregon's now standing Global Warming Commission. Uh, he's got a ton of experience to share with us, so thanks for being here. Um, and, and really, before I hand it over, I'd, that's my last piece, is just to publicly thank you so much for making the time and taking the effort to join us for the conversation. Welcome. Mayor Percy, members of the council, thank you very much. Um, as uh, Matt indicated, my name is Angus Duncan. Um, and I am speaking today, I think, with my um, Global Warming Commission hat on, although I have the BEF hat. I also um, represent the Natural Resources Defense Council, NRDC, uh, working on uh, utility, energy, and carbon efficiency uh, issues in the Pacific Northwest and up into the inner mountain states and you know a couple of other hats if depending on you know which warrant the bailiff shows up with that day um, and I will also acknowledge um, you know your your uh, uh, Commissioner Zelenka and an old co-conspirator of mine from many years uh, particularly in the electric utility business uh, but I also uh, managed to snooker Alan into joining the Global Warming Commission, and we're very glad to have him. Um, so I'm going to try to <coughs> heed Matt's uh, admonitions and work my way through the inevitable PowerPoint, um, you know, fairly quickly, and then try to come back and and see if we can spend the time talking about how uh, the city of Eugene is moving forward on its climate agenda and on setting targets. And with any luck at all, I will figure this out and the slides won't show up upside down. <laughs> so um, in 2004, Governor Kulingowski put together a, uh, a global warming advisory uh, group <clears throat> to try to do a, not just a, a goal setting, but also a, a, an implementation plan. Um, and we came up with recommended goals for the state of Oregon. Uh, three of them one that by this is 2004 so by 2010 we wanted to have taken that you know what looked like an inevitably upward trending line about one to two percent every year since we started measuring in 1990 we wanted to turn that one around and at least flatten it if possible bend it back down hill by 2010 by 2020 we wanted to be 10 percent below our 1990 levels, which is the where the line starts there. And by 2050, we wanted to be at least 
75% um, below 1990 levels. The only one of those three goals that has sort of any grounding in you know, anything other than coming out of my back pocket one night um, is the 2050 goal, and at the time, the IPCC, the UN uh, uh, panel of scientists, was recommending you know, not less than 75% reduction globally. So we simply grabbed that as um, a good 2050 goal, understanding that many of us voting for it at the time you know, weren't going to see whether we made it in 2050 or not. But you needed a goal out there, and, and, and it should have some grounding in science, and that was the one we had. The other two goals, though, were, were deliberately chosen um, to be both stretch goals and achievable goals. Um, we thought at the time that uh, that simply arresting the growth, you know, in the, in the succeeding five years was going to be a challenging goal all by itself, um, and then we wanted an, at least an intermediate goal between there and 2050. Um, so the 2020 number basically literally came out of my back pocket as I was, you know, drafting the report for the governor late one night. Um, that's about as scientific as we got. So I, uh, um, I, I commend you for, for making more of an effort than that. But I also commend to you the, 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 the relationship between having goals that are grounded, having goals that, put, that, that, that require reach, <clears throat> but also having goals <clears throat> excuse me, that are achievable. Um, and having intermediate, basically, uh, check-in goals so that, um, you know, we, we are not simply deferring, we are working on this until we hit our scientific goal, by which time it's too late to have achieved anything. So how did that all work out for us? Well, as it turned out, um, one of the things you, it's really handy to have when you're trying to set goals is good data, and we didn't have it in 2004. Um, our, our most current data, when we looked at this, uh, were, were, were numbers from, I think, 97 or 98. We didn't even realize that by 1999, we would have, uh, that Oregon would have peaked in its greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so got to have good data, got to have reasonably current data. This is something we're still working on at the state level, trying to get numbers that are never <clears throat> more than two years out of date, and to the extent possible, the critical number is not more than one year out of date. And we're actually almost there. Um, and, and the fact that we peaked in 98 or 99 um, and actually flattened the, the line subsequently says, you know, that was a good goal. We had, we had to work to get, actually to get the, the line to stop going up and to stay, stay level um, while demographics and, if you will, economic appetites were still driving it upwards. Um, so a sideways moving goal, a sideways moving line, you know, is a good sort of starting point, uh, but it's not a sufficient one. And even those those last two or three years where it looks like it's going downhill, those are recession years. So there's no guarantee that <clears throat> we really have achieved um, uh, uh, anything other than arresting the the increase in emissions. But we do look forward to some of the measures that we have proposed and some of the measures that are starting to take hold. And so I also commend to you these lines, which are almost unreadable. Sorry about that. Uh, but we adopted a set of energy efficiency recommendations, which uh, variously the Energy Trust of Oregon and uh, utilities like EWEB you know, were undertaking. And that pulled our projected line going forward down again. Um, <clears throat> We looked at, uh, we looked at the state adopted one of our recommendations, which was a renewable portfolio standard uh, that aimed at being, having 25% new renewables meeting state loads by 2025. Projected that out and that brought the line down a little further. The orange line is kind of interesting because you would have expected that one to be much bigger. That's the agreement that we negotiated five years ago with Portland General Electric. Um, that it would close Oregon's only in-state coal plant by 2020. Um, and when that happened, um, then you'd pull that coal plant out of our projections, and that drops our line down again. 
But interestingly, it doesn't drop our line down as dramatically as you would think when you take a 585 megawatt coal plant offline because there are so many other sources, just utility sources, let alone transportation, forestry, and ag. Add in the low carbon fuel standard, with the which the legislature finally confirmed earlier this year. Um, and that's the projected line that we see for Oregon as of about 2012. Um, it's still going downhill at least until 2025, you know, when demographics and consumption start bending it back upwards again. So it's a beast you have to keep feeding. And you have to keep feeding it because that's really the trajectory we should be on as a state, and we are not. Um, since we are not, that goes to sort of a, another question about goal setting or target setting, which is on, on the one hand, um, you need to look at everything if you're going to hit that goal. On the other hand, you can't assault everything immediately. You do need to be strategic in, in setting your near-term targets and near-term measures. And that's what we tried to do. So this is another way of looking at our emissions and the different shares that different sectors have. Clearly, electricity use and transportation are by far our largest ones. Um, and actually, if you pull out of that just light duty vehicles from transportation, so that's the cars we drive and the light trucks and delivery trucks and so on, that's actually about 25% of Oregon's greenhouse gas emissions all by itself. Coincidentally, if you pull just the coal, sec the coal share of the electricity sector out of u electric utilities, it's another 25%. If we could get control of our light duty vehicles and control of our coal plants, um, we would be, be attacking 50% you know, of the emissions that we have to reduce as a state. Doesn't mean we can ignore all those others, does mean we have to focus down on these ones. So let me just go through and talk to you a little bit about what we're doing as a state. Um, and you, can, you will see the intersection between that and what has to be done um, by local governments as well. Um, so it turns out we also peaked in vehicle miles traveled as a state um, a little bit later. I can't see that. It looks like about 2006 or 2007. Um, yeah, and, uh, and uh, uh, our greenhouse gas emissions for transportation alone peaked a little bit later than that. So arguably, pretty much all of the reduction in transportation is, um, uh, is recession related. Means we do not have a handle on you know, everything we need to, um, but it does help that our VMT peaked then and has started to go down if we can keep it going down. And also, as you can see from the orange sector, which is um, the, the, the larger vehicles, um, so that's basically uh, I'm sorry, the, 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 the orange is, is the gasoline. And the troublesome thing about that is that um, it does bump back up again as we come out of the recession. So it's just reinforcing that we don't have a handle on our light duty vehicles. We did a statewide look at what we'd have to do to get to our 2050 goal. Um, this is an ODOT process. And essentially what we have to do is pretty much everything uh, so it's land use choices and bringing VMT down. It is uh, converting our vehicle fleet out of gasoline and diesel. Um, and, and if we're converting it, as we probably are, into electricity, plugging it into a grid that is substantially less carbon intensive than the current one is. Um, it is using uh, transportation um, um, IT technologies to reduce congestion uh, and reduce also reduce VMT, reduce driving around looking for parking spaces. It is mode shifting to transit and bike and ped, and ultimately it's pricing. And we actually figured out um, using the state's green step model, which we developed with ODOT, that we could get to a minus 75% by 2050 in transportation. The most important way we got there, you know, other than punching all of the buttons, is to punch the vehicle conversion, fleet conversion button the hardest. You know, the single most important thing we would have to do is we would have to have a fleet by 2050 that is at least 50% um, electric, 
or the equivalent in biofuels, and it would have to be plugging into a grid which is also compliant with Oregon's at least 75 percent below 1990 levels by 2050. So that's a big lift, but it also is the most important single one, and that's why we go back and we focus on cars and coal. Um, there we go. This is another way to reinforce that point. Um, I just went out and looked at different, um, different cities around the country that had um, emissions roughly comparable to what we were facing in Oregon, depending on whether you lived in Pacific or territory, in PGE territory, or in this case I used Eugene, but any um, consumer-owned utility territory. Um, and, and getting the, the carbon equivalent of miles per gallon out of the electrical grid, you can see that if you live in Pacific Core territory, you know, you're about where Wichita, Kansas is. And you know, if you plug an electric vehicle in in Wichita, Kansas, you're getting about 35 miles to the gallon carbon equivalent, which is not bad, but not nearly as good as it can be and as it has to be. And I don't have to belabor this, but you can see, depending on how much coal and how much gas you have in your grid, um, you can get you know, over 100 miles per gallon carbon equivalent, or you can be back then, or you might as well buy an, a new uh, internal combustion engine, because you can right now today get 35 or 55 miles per gallon uh, from an internal combustion engine. Um, we have to do better than that. We have to do what Seattle or, frankly, Eugene does you know, when we convert our fleet. And this is Oregon's problem. It's not Eugene's problem, but it definitely is Oregon's, and that is that uh, although we have made the decision to shut down the Boardman plant, although the state of Oregon, of Washington made a subsequent decision that it would shut down the two Centralia plants, we are still taking power from this arc of coal plants around the Intermountain West. Um, and, and even eWeb, correct me if I'm misstating this, Alan, but I think even eWeb, because it's buying system power from time to time, has some coal in the mix. Not very much, but it, it almost certainly has some. We have to back that coal out. Um, again, apologies for the, the slide. I should have made it brighter. Um, but I'm putting this up just to draw the contrast. So. If we take Oregon's greenhouse gas reduction goal, and we, which is that slanted line down, and we measure it against where the IRPs for both Pacific and PGE are headed today, uh, where coal is coming out of the system but it's largely being replaced by baseload gas plants, the practical effect of that is that the line, the emissions line goes sideways indefinitely. It is not approximating where it needs to be. There is a bill in the legislature, which I'm heavily involved in and tracking even from a distance, um, and which we hope will get out of this legislature, that would do something different. So the top graph there is the one you just saw with the IRP stretching away to the right. The bottom graph, I'm sorry? IRPs are. IRPs, what did I say? Integrated Resource Plan. I'm sorry, integra Integrated Resource Plan. I'm, I, I keep thinking I'm talking to Alan all by himself here. So these are the utilities plans for what resources they're going to rely on to meet load you know, over the next 20 years. And in the case of both PGE and Pacific, it's as coal plants come out, they're replaced by gas plants. Gas plants are about half as carbon intensive as the coal plants they're replacing, but that's offset once again by um, demographic upward pressures and consumption upward pressures. So you end up with a line that goes sideways. Um, if we are able to ramp out those coal plants by 2030, as this bill would propose to do, if we are able to commit the two utilities to um, not, not the existing renewable portfolio standard through 2025, but one through 2040 that will require them to meet at least 50% of their load by 2040 from new renewables. If we pile those new renewables on top of the existing hydro that the state of Oregon relies on, um, you know, two things happen. One is that our electric utilities um, are actually down below that, um, that trajectory, uh, which is their proportional share of the state's greenhouse gas goals by 2040. Um, and 
uh, by, sorry, by 2035, which is as far out as we and, and uh, their IRPs go. Um, but, but with additional renewables coming into the system, we expect them to be, meet our th in interim 2035 goal and also be on a trajectory to meet the state's 2050 goal. And the other thing, effect that has, of course, is if we are able to do our shift of, of our light duty vehicle fleet to electric, then the electric, the, those vehicles are plugging into the grid that they have to plug into. And we have the potential for meeting both our transportation and our, uh, and our uh, electric utility goals by 2050. Um, this is just another last way of looking at it, which is that these are, uh, this is a wedge analysis that the Global Warming Commission did over the last year to say if we were going to try to pull all of our system into compliance with our state goal, which is the black line, the almost invisible black line, um, if we do what we're proposing to do with power generation, that's the purple wedge, um, if we do what we're proposing to do with transportation, the orange wedge, um, that gets us to a significant degree closer to our overall state line. It still doesn't get us all the way. And so we illustrated trying to meet the balance with a carbon tax, could also have been a carbon cap and trade um, that would pull all of the sectors down toward or in compliance with that line. Um, so it means if we get this bill through the legislature this year, um, we will be a substantial degree closer to um, our trajectory, but we'll still not be there, and it means we'll have to come back in the legislature next time around um, and, um, uh, uh, and, and try to adopt a, a cap or a tax. Um, that gets us to, um, to a, a significant chunk of our state goals, but again, it only gets us so far, even in transportation, if all we've done is flip the fleet. It means we haven't done the land use measures. It, we haven't done the mode shift to transit by PED. You know, we haven't done a number of other measures that we rely on the communities to do. Um, it also means that we, we need the reinforcement from the federal level, as does the city of Eugene, particularly from the fleet fuel economy standards, which would help drive that electrification of the fleet and from the Clean Power Plan, which you know, right now is under a Supreme Court stay, but we expect the district court to, um, or I'm sorry, the appeals court to rule on it by June or July, and we're hopeful that it goes forward, then reinforcing both what you're doing and what we're doing. And I'm going to stop there, because I assume we will come back and talk about um, targeting in more detail and pass it on to Matt. Great, thanks. And I just have a couple of quick uh, thoughts to add to the conversation. Um, one, and I think Angus is making this point, that it, if we're going to meet our targets, whatever they are, state and federal action are going to be crucial for us to get there. So we can set very aggressive targets, but it's going to be, we won't get there without that kind of support. Um, and the other thing I wanted to touch on was a comment from um, from Monday and just, you know, why why would we, Eugene, you know, stretch out and, and, and lead in this way and take these steps to reduce our emissions. And I just want to remind you all that we are in a large and very growing group, of, rapidly growing group of cities that are taking action like this. We are not by any means out um, alone. We are, you know, we're looking at a more aggressive target than some, uh, but we're, we're certainly in good company of, of a number of cities around the world that are taking action like this. Um, and in fact, I just wanted to call your attention to a few. Um, the one that we're looking at most closely, which is Fort Collins, Colorado, they've just set a community-wide target to reduce their emissions 80% by 2030. They're getting help from Rocky Mountain Institute to figure out exactly how that can be done. They're working on a plan right now. They're about a year ahead of us in setting that target. Um, and so there's a lot for us to learn from looking at them. Naturally, they're going to have some differences because they're in the Rocky Mountains and um, there are different community um, uh, conditions, but they're very similar to us in terms of population, having a university in, in the area. Um, but there are other, other cities that have similarly, similarly aggressive goals. Sydney, Australia, aiming for 70% reduction by 2030. Vancouver, BC, looking to be carbon neutral by 2050. Melbourne, Australia, looking to be carbon neutral by 2020. Um, so there are some very aggressive targets that have been set out. And uh, just wanted to put that into the conversation. And so the rest of the time is, uh, is for you all questions. Thank you very much. Thank you both. Um, so Mike, you're up first, I believe. 
Thank you, Mayor. And thank you very much for the presentation. That was very good. Um, question I've always had, why doesn't the state classify hydro as renewable? And should they? Why, so, why not? So um, the utility industry certainly regards hydro as renewable. Um, and I don't know anybody in the state who doesn't regard hydro as renewable. Um, the distinction I think it's important to draw is between existing renewable and new renewable, and that's the distinction the RPS draws. Um, but but uh, uh, we expect a pretty wide diversity of new renewable resources to be applied to um, meet, meeting the renewable portfolio standard. But the number I gave you a little bit earlier about how if we're able to make those goals with Pacific and PGE, um, we would not only be in compliance with our state goals, uh, but the state as a whole would be somewhere between 70 and 90 percent renewable. But the only way we get to 70 and 90 percent renewable is uh, if we count our existing hydro base and add on to the top of that mm -hmm. um, our solar and our wind and, and other smaller resources. That's, re that's the renewable base. I suppose it's an eWeb policy then. My question spawns from the, the point that here in Eugene, eWeb, e the requirements for the percentages of purchase of renewable is new renewable and we have to sell very inexpensively produced hydropower outside this market while we have to bring in very expensive types of power by by rule at eweb and mm -hmm. end up with a, an inefficient system so i was just trying to understand that better well so i guess the the other thing i would want to say to you is that um that when i first started working in the wind industry in mm -hmm. the private sector this was, I don't want to overdate myself here, but it was, <laughs> it was back during the frontier days. Okay. Um, and wind was being generated at about $250 a megawatt hour. Um, and a lot of people asked, this is down in California where I worked for a while, because that's where the business was. And people said, California, why are you doing this? Um, the answer was, you don't get a technology like that down to cost competitiveness unless you're willing to pay some more up front. That $250 a megawatt wind that we were building down there is now building for somewhere between $60 and $70 a megawatt hour, um, and, and it is still dropping significantly. So my foundation, along with four other uh, consumer-owned utilities, all from the state of Washington, you know, we built a wind farm 10 years ago. We brought it in for about $70 a megawatt hour. Today, we could probably build it in the same wind regime, same access to transmission for somewhere close to $50 a megawatt hour. Yeah. Um, so the way you get technologies to be competitive is you buy them and you create market pull on the technologies. Um, you, it, it is instructive also to go back and look at some of the um, the, the, the really hair-tearing editorials were, that were written back in the 1930s when, when, we, when the, the states and the, the, the region and the federal government proposed to build two large dams on the Columbia River, Bonneville and Grand Coulee, that we would never be able to use the power. It cost way too much. You know, Portland <laughs> was doing just fine with gas lights, right? Um, and now it's the cheapest power on the planet. But it wasn't when we started, and neither are wind and solar, but they are well on their way to becoming so. Thank you. Yeah. Next up is Claire. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming and, and sharing your uh, insights and background. This is really helpful as we think about what we're doing here locally. Um, for example, I thought that once the Boardman plant shut down, you know, coal wasn't going to be a factor in our carbon emissions. Um, so I wasn't aware of, of the fact that the other utilities in the state were drawing from coal-powered uh, sources for their energy. So I think that's really important information. I had a couple of questions. Um, does or how does the state climate goals and measurement take into account the fact that we sit along a major transportation corridor where um, cars and trucks are traveling through our state, they're not interstate, um, and do we also include in those measurements aircraft who are flying through the state and their emissions? 
So both really good questions, and the even bigger problem with with um, sort of through traffic you know, on I-5, you know, it's is less the cars and more the trucks, you know, the, especially the big over the road trucks. So we actually do count the emissions uh, in our inventory. Um, we basically allocate a chunk of emissions based on uh, assumed uh, fuel efficiency of the vehicles, how many there are, and how many miles they, they drive. Um, we do also take into account, we, we allocate a share of um, aircraft emissions associated with takeoffs and landings within the, the state of Oregon. Um, so we have them in the inventory, which is not quite the same thing as saying we know what to do about them. Um, the truth is that um, both of those sectors are sectors where you and we are going to rely heavily on the federal government. You know, we rely on the federal government particularly for fuel economies, for uh, the over-the-road uh, vehicles, um, and the federal government actually has adopted some, you know, a sort of equivalently stringent um, rules for over-the-road trucks to our, the light-duty trucks. Um, but the way we get at those is at least primarily is is through national standards. Um, there are some things that we can do, and we do have measures in our in our uh, uh, state strategy. For example, for um, uh, I installing electrical plug-ins at truck stops, so that we don't have trucks sitting there and running their diesels. Um, and, and that's valuable both for reducing carbon emissions um, and for reducing local uh, air shed pollution. Um, so there are some things that we can do. There are some things we can and do do at the uh, Portland Airport, for example, um, to, to reduce emissions associated with moving the planes you know, in and out of the, the, uh, uh, the gates, but pretty limited. And there are now adopted international standards for uh, fuel efficiency for new aircraft coming into the fleet, they are not very stringent. You know, it's, what, it's what happened. You know, it's sort of the, the bigger the committee, the lower the average. Um, and, uh, um, and so there's a lot of work to still be done on that. But in both of those cases, you know, we do necessarily rely on the federal government. Um, we rely on, the, you saw that string of, of coal plants out there that I mentioned and that you referenced. And the truth is, um, if we stop taking coal generated electricity from those coal plants, that doesn't necessarily shut them down. You know, we can, we can shut down Boardman because it's within our, our boundaries. It's harder to, it, we can't control the plants. We can influence them, and if we withdraw, in effect, our business, that puts additional pressure, particularly on some of those older plants, to shut down. Um, but we rely heavily on the president and EPA and their clean power plan to really have an impact on, on the coal plants and the gas plants. Um, so we can do what we can, you can do what you can, uh, but the federal government has to carry its share of the burden as well. If can I speak really quickly to your question about local emissions when we measure emissions for our uh, Eugene carbon, um, our greenhouse gas inventory? We, when we look at air travel, we're trying to focus on specifically um, travel from Eugenians, not others that are coming and going. And similarly with road travel, we, we try to exclude the emissions of vehicles that are passing through on I-5. Uh, going back to the state measurement, so if there were new standards or as new standards came online for truck um, emissions, then you would adjust the model to take that into right. account in theory. Right. We would adjust our inventory to reflect that. And then this question is a little bit more directed to Matt, but um, obviously you're both welcome to respond. I just wanted to ask you to remind us to, to some extent how reaching these goals fits, um, is connected to our land use policy and efforts to reduce sprawl and how it connects with local transportation options. Right. Um, so the largest way that uh, land use decisions influence uh, greenhouse gas emissions is it, it, if it affects the transportation and how people get around. So the, overall, the more dense and the more mixed use a community is, um, the easier it is for people f to get around by bike or by walking, and the, the more cost-effective a bus system is, for example. So that's really where the, the, um, the large-scale changes are. are at the same time, when we look at um, emissions from buildings, uh, multifamily housing and smaller homes have a smaller footprint than single-family homes, for example. So um, the more we, uh, you know, allow provide that type of, of um, 
of housing for people. That also reduces emissions from, from housing. Um, there is, a, is another effect of, you know, if we, if we do expand our urban growth boundary or expand for, for development, um, it removes some areas that are used for carbon sequestration. So if we move into forest land, we reduce that, you know, that ability of that forest to sequester carbon. It's probably not huge, but it's, it's something. And, and similarly, even if we, if we move into farmland, there's, there's carbon sequestered in the soil. And so development um, into those areas reduces that ability. And, and if I can just add one, one observation that goes back to your target setting. <clears throat> um, it, it is a characteristic of urban areas that they are, they are just by uh, definition and design more carbon efficient than, than um, suburban areas or rural areas. You know, if New York City were its own state, it would be by a substantial margin the most efficient, carbon efficient state in the union, you know, not because they've fixed the steam tunnels, they haven't, it still leaks, but because they are so compact, so dense, you know, they, people live substantially in common wall dwellings, in, in apartments, you know, that are by definition also more efficient. You know, the, 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 the corridors are dense and can support uh, transit. And one of the things that is, is worth observing, I don't know whether you have a zip car or car to go here in Eugene yet, um, but but if you take a look at the you know, and and those are really interesting sort of intermediate you know modes that we need to figure out how to take advantage of you know rather than everybody having to have a car and and get into it all the time. So I use it a lot. But one of the things I have observed is that sort of like everybody else in the transportation game, they want a cream skim. And by cream skim, I mean, you know, they do better if their cars are in use a lot, which means they have to be in relatively dense areas. You know, we see a lot of them downtown, you know, during the day by, you know, 5.30, they're all gone because people, downtown is dense enough that people will make use of them, you know, to drive home or, or go do an errand. So the density issue <clears throat> doesn't mean we have to do away with single family detached homes, it does mean that our land use planning needs to look at opportunities to increase densities, you know, where you lose something if you're not in a, a you know, gracious neighborhood, but you gain something because you're in an, an urban neighborhood with access to amenities and necessities. So finding ways to, to for our communities to, you know, preserve some of our, uh, some of our, our uh, uh, single family neighborhoods, but find ways to increase densities, especially in corridors, the transit corridors is a really important part of succeeding in the transportation side. Thank you. We have uh, two more people in the queue for this round, and if we have time, we go to another round, but we're trying to hit the, as close as we can to the 1245, so just letting you know that. Um, very briefly, I want, oh, I'll put you in the, that's another one in the queue. Um, actually, the plug-in, so you could, you don't uh, pollute or use a, a power by idling, tr trucks idling actually came out of our Larapa here in, mm -hmm. um, in Eugene. I wanna give them credit for that. And I wanted to say that we did have, uh, we have zip cars. We had cars go, but they're not going here anymore because they didn't have enough exactly. um, usage to keep them um, in our community. And um, I wanted to say to Matt, as we think about this, sometimes like in Envision Eugene, when we have pillars and things, people don't really know what those pillars mean. Um, and I think as we go through this plan, I think we have to be really transparent about, for instance, when Claire brought up about uh, what are the land use things that we can do that people can see in front of them the list of those things in a really clear way and then the choices that council is going to make to try to move those things. So it's really clear to people what you're doing, why you're doing it, and what you're choosing to do and what you think the results of that will be and that we have those for the public and for us all to sort of follow through as we go through this process so, to, because I think it will engage them with us in this, which is one of the biggest things that we have, we have to do. Did you want to say something, Angus? No. Okay. No. All right. I, would so say, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Oh. <laughs> Angus, thanks for coming down and from Portland and, and spending the uh, uh, 45 minutes with us. I uh, always had this 
thing about the meeting should last as long as the transportation that takes to get there, but that, is, that never <laughs> works, it seems. Um, yeah. The last few years, we've seen a decline in our, in our emissions at the state level, um, and the cause of that, you said, was the Bush recession. and, 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 and Partial that. cause. <laughs> what? Partial cause. Yeah, part, and so, and, so, but that's not sustainable. And so are, are we on that trajectory? Uh, are we still going down, or are we kind of going up? Are we staying flat? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm, the unfortunate thing about recessions is at some point they end, right? And uh, and you have to deal. As an effective greenhouse gas control, they're great except they end. Um, <laughs> and so you have to you have to to pile in again. I think the 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 answer to this also goes to sort of to, to your goal setting or your target setting. You know, we, it's good to have a, a science based long term goal. It's also really good to have interim goals that allow you to really focus on the measures that are available to you today, the technologies that are available to you today, and how you use those to hit those interim goals. This is why our commission uh, <clears throat> adopted, last year adopted, a 2035 goal. Looked like we weren't going to hit the 2020 goal, but we thought that there was a better opportunity to hit the 2035 goal. And you know those, those lines you saw with the two electric utilities suggested, yes, you know, we can do that. So I guess the answer to you, Alan, is, is if this bill passes, um, then you know, I think it is more likely than not that we will hit our 2035 goal for electric utilities for, um, and for transportation, and we may hit them for the energy, that energy efficiency wedge as well. Um, we still have industry and ag and forestry where we're not you know, making the kinds of gains that we need to make. But that's because we're trying to be strategic in focusing our measures. So um, if, if we get things in place, tools in place that get us to our goals for transportation for utilities, our two big ones, you know, then we've got time to turn and work on those other sectors and try to bring them down to, to target that 2035 goals as well. So, I mean, the answer to your question is, Bill passes, you know, we are definitely on a downward slant. We're not on the downward slant that we need to be. And I, I guess the one other thing I would make mention of, is, so it goes back to the observation about all that coal by wire coming into the state. Mostly, Oregon has a inside the boundaries inventory. So any emission that originates inside our boundaries, um, we count. But because we were importing so much coal by wire, it's such a big part of, you know, of what we do that affects greenhouse gas emissions. We decided early on you had to include that as well. So that's what we would call a consumption-based inventory, and you guys are, I know, familiar with that as well. So we have a partial inside the boundary and a partial consumption-based. And about five years ago, we sat down with DEQ and said, well, what if we looked at an entire consumption-based, what if we took another perspective on this and looked just at a consumption base. Any emissions originating in Oregon with a good or service that goes out of state, we net out. But we then start counting all of the emissions associated with building all those flat screen TVs in China and importing them to Oregon and using them and disposing of them here. Interestingly, our, our emissions inventory increased by about 12 or 13 percent. Well, of course it did. We're a relatively wealthy state. You're a relatively wealthy community. We are offshoring a lot of the, of the emissions that we used to, you know, uh, that used to originate within the, <clears throat> this country. Um, it's another way of looking at it, and it is something that we as a state think we need to go back and revisit our targeting as well. And so what we may end up with is two different targets. You know, one, uh, a traditional one, which is what you saw, but a second one that is, to that is targeted specifically at that consumption-based inventory and how we, how we take responsibility for those emissions that, you know, we sent out of state, but we're still responsible for by our consumption habits. Yeah. One of the things that I've noticed, and, and you mentioned the Global Warming Commission interim goal, is that most people are doing this long-term reach goal <coughs> that they want to strive for, and, and then having some kind of interim goal that that, that uh, uh, makes 
uh, that, that it gets established so you can get a, a better sense of getting to a target because jumping from where we are now to that long-term goal is, seems very daunting and almost impossible. So having this interim goal seems to be a way of getting people to, to move towards that goal but having it by an interim. Can you talk to that as a strategy? Just, just, yeah, just very briefly. So we assume there are going to be technologies emerging as, as controlling carbon exerts a pull, both a market and a regulatory pull, on uh, on um, uh, on the economy, on inventors, um, I, I have often said that if we adopt a carbon cap nationally or as a state, um, the second most important thing about it is it will compel people to bring their emissions down in compliance with the cap. But the most important thing it does is it sends a signal out into the economy into particularly the private sector that says, if you come up with a really smart way of doing something that's a lot less carbon intensive, you're gonna make buckets of money. And <clears throat> sending that signal into the economy, um, short, short term, medium term is really important because uh, we're not going to hit those long term goals with the technologies we have. We will hit them with the technologies that we force into the marketplace, like bringing the cost of wind and solar and storage down. Um, so, so it is important, given our existing technologies, that we have an interim goal that those existing technologies enable us plausibly to hit. You know, that's what you saw when you saw that electric, those two electric utility lines. We have the technology today to hit those. We don't necessarily have the technology to hit them in a cost-effective way, but between now and 2030, when, when the, the, that RPS ramps in and the coal ramps out, we expect that the cost of wind and solar and storage you know, are all three going to be, be down to a point where they're going to be cost competitive with you know, wherever gas is on average between now and 2030, and, and they will you know, blow coal out of the water. So having an interim goal allows you <clears throat> to look at the technologies you have today, you know, draw a line between them and what is achievable if you fully deploy them. So that also goes to you know, your land use choices, to mode shift from single occupant vehicles to you know, transit, bike, ped, <clears throat> you know, car to go, you know, the, all of the other options that we need to have at, on a transportation basis. That's, that's, those are the real values, I think, of, of, of the interim goals. Um, and there's a psychological value, too. And that is, you know, you give people a, a target they can hit. It's a, probably a little bit like dieting. If you say, I'm going to lose 20 pounds this year, well, you know, that's a lot of pounds to lose. If, you're gonna, if you say, I'm going to lose five pounds in the next three months, you know, that's a doable target. Well, it's doable for some of us. I'm still having difficulty. Um, so I, I think it's important psychologically as well as technologically, Alan. Yeah, one last uh, uh, question or request. Uh, you talked about the wedge analysis and how all these actions take place uh, at different levels, the energy efficiency, transportation, waste, agriculture, uh, power generation, and the carbon mm -hmm. tax to get us down there. And, and breaking that down even further, you have federal, state, and local actions that, that get us there. Um, and, and I guess for Matt, uh, what are the local actions that we'll be responsible for, besides the very important one of advocating for those state and federal policies that uh, reduce those greenhouse gases, like Senate Bill 1574, the cap and trade bill, and House Bill 4036, which is the Clean Energy and Coal Transition Act, which are coming up. Um, Besides the advocating for that stuff, what are the? Can you get us a list of the things that we're going to be looking at at a lo local level? Because we're not responsible for all of it to get us to that line. Right. Uh, the things that we can can grapple with, you know, like the land use and the transportation and bike pad and electric vehicles, and, and maybe draw off the scenario planning analysis that the MPC did that looked at our transportation system to get us to a lower carbon footprint. There's a lot of actions in there, too, that are at the local level that we can. So if we can get a list of those things, that would be very helpful, I think, for the next round of things. Yeah, and, we, and I'll just say that uh, we are looking to refresh our, our list of, of climate, climate, you know, carbon reduction strategies. Um, it will be, you know, starting with what we have already on the books, the Climate Action Plan, which has a bunch of those, but then refreshing that and, and then really calculating how much reduction can we get from each of those strategies. So that's definitely in, in the queue. And I would really encourage you to keep, yeah, get consumption and waste management, um, you know, 
clearly on your list as well. They, they tend to drop out because we focus on the transportation and land use authorities of local governments. Right. Um, but you know, that's, that's something that has to be done at a community level also. Right, yeah. And, and you know, the federal and state issues are, are going to be the bulk of this. So we're going to be working on our portion of it, but it's not the whole thing. Right. Okay, yeah, if we get that. Good. Thank you. Chris? Yeah, um, I'll, I'll try to go quick. Um, something you mentioned about New York City really got my brain going. We um, are debating how to deal with population growth and the impact on the environment of the community. And um, we've just been given information that indicates that single-family homes are more environmentally um, positive than apartment buildings for for um, energy consumption and environmental desirability. And I, I won't dispute the fact that three single-family homes with nine people in them are probably more environmentally um, sustainable than an apartment building with 50 in them. But the issue that we're wrestling with is if you have, I'm looking for the apples to apples. If you've got 10,000 people all in single-family homes and 10,000 people in multifamily housing, um, are the single-family homes still environmentally overall um, the better choice than putting them in multifamily housing. And the reason I brought this up is you mentioned New York City being very environment. Um, well, carbon efficient. Carbon efficient, that's the word I'm looking for. Right. Mm -hmm. we're, we're getting information that says if we keep everybody in single family homes, that's more carbon efficient. It's better than putting multifamily housing. I, I have never seen a credible study that that uh, and I certainly haven't seen all the studies out there, so maybe there is one. Um, and but I have never seen a credible study that says that single-family detached dwellings are more carbon efficient than multifamily dwellings. Um, and intuitively, uh, I don't see how that could be the case. Um, if you I I assuming the the same number of people are involved in both cases as you did, um, you know, multifamily. Think about the. The, um, the shell of a single family house and how much exposure it has with walls and windows, all of which leak. You know, it, you know, even, even the best insulated house leaks. And let's, let's stipulate that they are sort of equally well insulated. Then think about a multifamily dwelling where uh, only the outside wall leaks, but you know, most of the walls in my apartment you know, simply separate me from uh, the, the family in the next apartment. And so if it leaks, it leaks in both directions and, and it's stable. You're not losing energy. You're not losing heat energy out of, uh, uh, out of those walls. Um, there are other considerations with multifamily housing as well. Uh, but again, the most important one from my perspective is, um, is if you can locate multifamily dwellings in transit corridors, then they reinforce the, the um, carbon efficient efficiency of the transportation system as well. So um, I'd be really interested in seeing, you know, whatever the study is that um, uh, you've been provided with that suggested such a counterintuitive outcome because it doesn't make any sense to me. Okay, I, I, it's a it's a longer conversation for another time. I just wanted to get the benefit of a certified smart person that we happen to have sitting. Well, I didn't bring a certified smart person with <laughs> me, but next time I will. Thank you, Betty. You're up. Oh, thank you. First, I'm glad the mayor mentioned El Rapa mm -hmm. um, Lane Regional Air Protection Agency, which it was there that the that the uh, chargers for the bus truck stops started. Mm -hmm. As an employee of El Rapa. Um, I think you've. I think we should emphasize the importance of not expanding the urban growth boundary. I'm thinking of things we can do locally, mm -hmm. rather than waiting for the state and federal. Uh, preserving the forests and the agricultural land. Um, also, we we established a goal of the ratio of single family to multifamily some time ago and I think we did it the wrong way um, well I said that so at the time but we I th as I remember we said 60 40 was that it 45 55 45 55 but 55 would be single family, yes. single family and that should be reversed I think but if uh, actually it should be a bigger the, the single family residences that are there now should be allowed to stay obviously but for future, it seems to me that we it would make more sense to say 60 multifamily, 40 single family, for example. 
What's your opinion of that? You know, I think each community is going to have to figure out where its balancing point is because this is, this is, you know, we, we don't do, we, we shouldn't be doing anything on the basis of carbon efficiency alone. Uh, <clears throat> one of the real potential advances, you know, and I'll just put a little plug in it here for it with, with the Eugene City Council, one of the real advances that uh, in tools that we have uh, in this state is, is a, uh, uh, something called Mosaic, um, which was developed by the Department of Transportation and some consulting firms and a stakeholder group. And it is an effort to try to take the lessons learned in least cost planning in the utility side and see the extent to which we can adjust them and apply them um, uh, to transportation decisions as well. So, and, and the really interesting thing about Mosaic um, is is it forces the trade-offs between, for example, you know, the amenities of single family versus the amenities of multifamily, the carbon efficiency of each one of those, um, you know, safety, um, you know, uh, local air pollution. You know, all of those considerations can be pulled together in this kind of a planning process and this kind of a planning tool. Um, and, and then the city council or the community you know, or stakeholders can say, What's most important to me? And they wait. You know, they may wait. Carbon efficiency more important as more important than uh, uh, than single family dwelling. They may they may wait. Safety is more important than carbon efficiency. But at least those trade offs are highly visible and transparent as they as they have become over you know, the last several decades in the electrical utility industry. And you're able to make those kinds of trade-offs. So you can look at, uh, you, you don't just look at single family versus multi-family in isolation. You can do that if you want to um, by just zeroing out the waiting for everything else, but you probably won't. Um, so that gives you an opportunity for the city of Eugene to come up with a you know, plan which is not the same as the city of Portland and not, God forbid, the same as New York City. I don't think any of us here want to live in New York City for all of its carbon efficiency. I certainly don't. Uh, but there are things about New York City that, that um, can transfer here. And using Mosaic as a way of analyzing your transportation choices you know, in a corridor um, uh, is a really useful way of you know, both forcing carbon efficiency into the equation, uh, but putting it in its proper place. What's more That's proper, my plug. What's more proper than breathing? <laughs> um, that, then, then you wait breathing and, lo and local air quality higher, and you can zero out everything else. Um, another question. Yes. Air, air, we're getting more and more air conditioners. They're, they used to almost not exist in the Northwest. And you, you and I can remember that, can't we? Yes. And <laughs> isn't that really bad for the air quality? Our air conditioners? Yes. Um, that, that's probably going to get me out ahead of my technology headlights. Um, okay. what, what I can say is that um, there are some public health reasons, as the climate grows warmer, there are some public health reasons for um, having more air conditioning, um, and I think we just have to deal with that. That's one of the ways you deal particularly with uh, the potential for heat stroke. Less of an issue here than it is going to be, say, in Chicago or Wichita or Abilene. Um, but but the, the real challenge I think air conditioning <clears throat> uh, has for us is when it's a discretionary choice. And by the way, I don't have air conditioning in my house in Portland, and you know I can live with it. Um, but, but some people will choose to have air, more and more will choose to have air conditioning. So the real issue then becomes, as with automobiles, are we feeding that air conditioner the most carbon efficient electricity that we can? And is that air conditioning the most energy and carbon efficient that it can be. A lot of window air conditioners is not a very efficient way to air condition your house, for example. Well, having lived in Illinois without an air conditioner, I don't think it's essential here. <laughs> <laughs> My family's all from Illinois, too, and I remember those summers. And they had their own special charm, I admit, but you did sweat a lot. <laughs> well, you can live without it. Yes. Um, <laughs> About buses, which uh, you were talking about the advantages of buses, I see the buses putting on a lot of smoke. Yep. 
and it looks to me as if they're polluting as much as of, as of four or five cars at least. So I don't know where Eugene is in converting its bus fleet. I know that you know, TriMet is, from my perspective, way behind. Um, and it's because diesel buses are cheaper and diesel fuel is cheaper short term, but neither of those are cheaper long term. Um, so that's another major conversion that we have to make. Even diesel bus buses, if their load factors are high enough, are a lot more carbon efficient than individual automobiles with single drivers. Um, LTD just, all MXs are hybrids and they just bought new hybrids too. Is it your turn? <laughs> <laughs> Good. No. Alan can do with a rolled up newspaper from time to time. <laughs> I'm a te I was a teacher. <laughs> um, my next, I'm confused about cap and trade. Isn't that just putting it somewhere else? Um, it, it depends on how comprehensive the cap and trade is. Um, and and one of the one of the um, criticisms of this bill in the legislature right now is that if we stop coal by wire from coming into Oregon, are we really are are those coal plants simply going to turn around and sell their coal somewhere else and the emissions continue? And the answer in both cases is somewhere in between. Um, if we adopt cap and trade as a country, um, but but the Chinese are still building both coal plants and our television sets using electricity from those coal plants, you know, have we simply offshored our emissions? And, and the answer is that's why the president tried to cut a deal with China. Um, and, you know, and it remains to be seen whether that deal holds. But the only way we get to um, emissions controls that are meaningful um, is if the entire planet agrees to do it or nearly all of the planet agrees to it and certainly um, large emitters like China and India. Um, but the only way we get them to do it is we do it ourselves and a cap and trade is, if it's done right, is a pretty efficient way of reducing emissions. Um, it has been used for a number of criteria pollutants like um, uh, sulfur dioxides and nitrous oxides, and it has turned out to be a much more cost-efficient way of driving those emissions down. Yes, it means someone else, I'm reducing my emissions, someone else is increasing theirs, but if overall the cap continues to decline, um, then what we're trying to do is find the most cost-efficient place to reduce the emissions. That's why it works. Disperse the pollution. Not disperse the pollu pollution, but find you know, which plant can reduce emissions most cost effectively. You know, then they can sell some of their reductions, as it were, to a plant that can reduce it less cost effectively. But if overall the combined emissions from those two plants is lower at the end of the day than it was at the beginning of the day, then we're reducing overall emissions even if we're changing the distribution. It always confused me when we talk about It is about confusing, trading. I know. I mean, trading, it just sounds like you get to do it because I'm not doing it. But thank you. Yes. So, Mike, fast because... Very fast for Matt, along the lines of what quest and that's it. Claire was asking. Do we measure change over time of the n amount of people who live in Eugene and work in Eugene versus live outside Eugene and work in Eugene. Do we measure the change in that over time? In that ratio? Yeah. Uh, not as a part of our carbon accounting. I suspect that planning mark measures that, but I don't know. So we don't look at our, our policies driving more people to live outside the community and drive in every day for work? That's not currently right part of, part of our greenhouse We're not even accounting. measuring. Right, we're not okay. measuring the, Thank not you. within our greenhouse gas and our carbon climate. But I think the urban growth boundary and, and the density requirements inside and outside you know, do have an effect on the migration question you're raising. Right. Yeah. And that's why I was wondering, are we even measuring to know whether or not we're causing an inadvertent problem mm -hmm. against our goals? Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I Thank you. Very helpful. Yeah. I, I, I will tell you on that on my time on the Northwest Power Council, you know, I seem to always go out and meet with the city council, you know, in Hermiston or someplace like that, you know, that wanted to protect their, their dams and their reservoirs and you know didn't care all that much about the fish. So it's nice to come in and talk to a very different city council. Thank you very much. 
Okay, we're going to move very rapidly now, but not rapidly enough, um, into the uh, <laughs> the two motions that uh, Alan has asked to uh, put before you. Yep. Sure. yep. I, I, actually, I'll just combine them. Uh, I move to the council to support Senate Bill 1574, the cap and trade bill, and House Bill 4036, the Clean Energy and Coal Transition Act. And if um, I get a second. Second. Moved and seconded. Just, uh, uh, I think these are two very important bills. They're coming up on the House floor uh, maybe this week uh, in the short session. Uh, and and uh, while well, the cap and trade bill may be s stuck for now, it might move out of, out of committee. Uh, the clean energy coal bill is certainly going to be on the Senate floor. They're both very consistent with what we've been talking about and getting us, and Angus is very eloquent about how it will reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Specifically in the cap and trade bill, just for folks who, who are not that familiar with that, the cap and trade bill says we cap emissions and then we lower the emissions that are possible within the state every year. And within that <coughs> reduction, you can either uh, reduce your own emissions or buy someone else's reductions in emissions so that each year we actually get a reduction in, in emissions. And that's what they've seen in California. This is based on the California uh, experience, which has been extremely successful. The money from the cap and trade system in California, which has realistically reduced greenhouse gas emissions, is going back into more projects to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So it's, and by the way, California, because they're so big, that amount of money uh, is uh, now $2.4 billion that's going back into greenhouse gas reduction projects of all sorts of transportation and social equity programs that are deal with low income folks and making sure that they are, are not taking the brunt of this, but uh, energy efficiency and all sorts of different kinds of projects. So I think Ethan's on the phone, is that correct? Yeah, he is on the phone if we have questions or so wants to speak to it. Questions, he's here. Yeah. And I, so far, I don't know if I got everybody, I heard various kind of things come out of people's mouths. I wasn't quite sure what I was getting, but I got Chris. Is anybody else in the queue? Mike. Okay. Chris. Yeah, just quickly, I, I understand that the IGR committee does not have a specific um, position on these two, but I did want to know what staff's uh, perspective was. Um, I assume they have vetted these, and I wanted to know if staff has a perspective on them, um, whether they're consistent with policy and they support them. I just want to know where staff is on them. That's Ethan. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm uh, picking up a little bit of uh, staff. Is that Councilor Pryor asking um, what the status of these two bills are? The staff uh, position. Staff position, Ethan. Okay. Um, on the, uh, uh, and, uh, hold on, and Ethan, trade. one second. It's just whether it's consistent with our legislative policies. Right. Yes. On the cap and trade uh, bill, we have direction from uh, council from a resolution regard that uh, specifically states uh, uh, for uh, city staff to lobby in support of statewide carbon pricing. That was also incorporated into the legislative priorities this last year, a document that uh, both the IGR and council has reviewed. And staff, uh, uh, our position was uh, support, and uh, Councilor Zalika provided testimony for that bill early on in, in its, um, uh, when it hit the floor. That one currently is in uh, a Senate, um, uh, the Joint Ways and Means Committee, awaiting a uh, um, subcommittee uh, designation, and so that one is kind of in limbo right now. The, excuse me, the second uh, uh, House Bill uh, 4036, that uh, we really don't have a position on, and the main piece uh, is because um, whether that bill passes or not, it will not uh, directly impact uh, power in Eugene. And so uh, there was no, not a position on that one. We were just tracking it. Okay, thank, that's all I need to know. Thank you. Okay, anybody else? Ethan, I was wondering if you could tell me what our voting on this uh, motion of Allen's will do for your work there that you haven't done already or that Allen's speaking on our behalf hasn't done already. Specific to 1574. To either of these bills. Uh, 
Madam Mayor, Councilor Clark, uh, in the, in the, I, I think that a, a motion from Council would um, be showing support to uh, our legislative um, um, uh, delegation, uh, specifically the chief sponsor, uh, Senator Chris Edwards, and the co-sponsor, uh, Senator Byer. So I think um, more than anything, it would uh, continue to uh, create a supportive relationship. So we haven't given them support yet. My question was, what would it do that we have not yet done? Uh, Madam Mayor, Councilor Clark, I would, once again, I would say that we have given support on the Senate bill, uh, yet um, it would just continue to build that support and show that Eugene is behind them. And so that's, that's Thank where you. I think we... Alan? Yeah, three things. Um, uh, as we noted, not only do we need to do our local actions, but we need to support those things that are at the state level that, that reduce greenhouse gases. These two things are directly related to that. That's why I brought them up today. And besides, they're in the um, Senate floor. Uh, so so uh, need to advocate for state policies, even though they don't necessarily impact us at the local level, is an important thing for us to do. We do not have a position on 4036, which would create our position. And secondarily, uh, uh, 1574 is a bill that was, is, as Ethan mentioned, sponsored by two of our local uh, senators, Senator Edwards and, and Senator Beyer, and uh, I think they deserve the council saying we support this, not indirectly through a resolution that we passed a year and a half ago. So I think putting our, our stamp on both of these as approval is uh, a, a worthy thing for us to do, and I encourage the council to support it. Ready to vote. All those in favor, please indicate. One, two, three, four, five, six. In opposition, none. So it passes. Both pass. Madam Mayor, I vote yes. Oh, sorry, George. I didn't even know you were there. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'm here listening. Okay. <laughs> All right. yeah. so that, that makes seven in favor. Thank you very much. Okay, we're going to move on rapidly. I guess I'll ask the it's question. It's going to be tough. I think her uh, the presentation is going to be just about the amount if not a little bit more than what we have left so i don't know whether you want to start it and have we've done this before and we ended up having kind of a yep a really not full conversation so i right. don't know if it's the most effective eddie i would prefer to wait i was the one who asked for this work session and i don't see Sorry. really what i asked for i want impossible motions to not about behavior but about re residences about uh, houses that are nuisances, all and, kinds of nuisances. And well, all kinds, but but not so much behavior. And I, um, the examples I gave were Browns. One of them was Brownsville, and the other was either the Dallas or Dallas. I know they're not alike, but I th thought you would have that record. And we didn't have either one of those in our materials. They're two places that have very good nuisance ordinances and I was hoping give to give us time for you right to... well let me um, just clarify why what this work session was which was a combination of I think part three of your conversation that started with on-site management the last time we were here you had we had indicated there was a couple of directions we might go to help deal with the behavior issues which was the only thing we were talking about at the time one of them was uh, the local agent and the other was a potential of a chronic nuisance code and so we were directed to come back with that. Since that time, you brought forward uh, the additional chronic nuisance issue in neighborhoods around boarded up buildings. So we were trying to combine them into one work session because they essentially would fall under the same section of the code. So it's sort of Allen's on-site management and your boarded up houses kind of need to come together. So if uh, we can come back and we can bring back some potential motions for that, if that's... Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, yeah, I, I, you know, we've we've talked about the social host ordinance quite a bit already, and and so I don't think we really need to go over that so much. Um, I was kind of under the same impression as Councillor Taylor is that it would be more like for nuisance, um, you know, falling down houses and addressing addressing eyesores and unsanitary things. And I'm I'm, I'm glad that you put in the Portland. Uh, code section that was really good but you know i was going well gee for comparison why why wasn't your jeans code what we already have in place and so if that could be included you know for the next one 
as well as the uh, requests of Councillor Taylor that would be good to so, yeah, I get a grip because I, I, I'm like other councillors, I bet everyone here has probably received some complaints from some of their constituents about falling down shacks or half burned down buildings that no one's dealt with for years and so I think I think Councillor Taylor's intent was more um, in that direction of, of I think they like got that, that and I, okay. but I do think that part of the conversation that um, we're talking about was not the social host ordinance. It was really that other conversation that Alan brought up a long time ago. Was that requiring somebody on site to um, on site management, apartment right, buildings? Right. That's the issue. So that those issues are still both out there. Right. Uh, yeah. Uh, I, did you? Have, yeah, I was there's there are two different things I think yeah and the the things that I thought was urgent before another hot summer was the abandoned buildings and they aren't always falling down sometimes there are nice homes that for some reason people have left them and there's firewood piled up and and dry vegetation and the rats take over and and people are terrified that there's going to be a fire for one thing but they're worried about also also about the rats reproducing and I, I would like to see some sample ordinances so that we could take action on something. And I know Brownsville had a very good policy. And I'm not sure now what the other one was. I sat at the council meeting at one time, but I, two at least I know that where they do inspections and, and they have strong policies to, for, to protect the neighborhood. Thank you. I've got Chris and Mike and Alan. Chris. Yeah, um, I saw the thing neighborhood livability and that just kind of goes into a big area. So I appreciate you're saying this is what we really wanted to talk about, but there may be an opportunity here that if we could have an entire work session, we could talk about these subjects. I think we could go through them hopefully fairly quickly. But I know as a counselor, probably the single most source of complaints I get are about livability issues which go beyond unruly gatherings and derelict buildings. Um, Parking, trash, barking dogs. I mean, if there's one thing you can do to demonstrate your responsiveness to your constituents, it's in dealing with this host of neighborhood um, nuisance liability issues. And so I, um, I don't want to just suddenly pile a whole bunch of additional work on you, but I know uh, we can talk about the things that you were going to talk about, and I'm just going to be chomping at the bit to say, okay, can we talk about turkeys? You know, can we can we talk about barking dogs? Can we talk about people driving down streets and parking and throwing trash and and other things out their car windows? Um, so figuring out a way, whether it's in two work sessions or whatever. But I think the whole issue of neighborhood livability is much larger than this. So I'm just putting it out there that I can think of, of a host of things that the community would really appreciate um, if we could get more um, clarity uh, and direction on. Chomping at the bit to clarify. Yeah, that's right. I, I, I want to talk about nutrients. Them too. <laughs> I still think there's a solution for that. Five dollars a tail bounty. But anyway, um, I hope we're going to talk about um, enforcement as a part of this because an ongoing nuisance has, a, a, you know, a, a, a part of. A, a part of that problem deals with the manner and the and the level which we enforce but for me the our city as a as a, on a broader level has a very imbalanced manner for code enforcement on minor issues so for example i have a neighbor who has you know, a, a complaint-based call because his chickens are too loud and one of them or two of them got out away and were running around in the neighborhood. And he had a couple of different people calling and, and dealing with enforcement and sending him a letter and threatening a fine. And then there are some much, in, in the view of most of my constituents, there are, there are other larger nuisance and issues that no matter how much people complain have no enforcement. So I, I would hope that that's a part of our discussion, how we have an equality of enforcement with nuisance codes or how we deal with enforcement better than we do today. Thank you. Alan. Yeah, uh, the, it, this came out of the request to talk about on-site management apartment complexes. And if you recall that, what we were wanting to look at was the, those large apartment complexes in uh, like the South University neighborhood that, that did 
did have on-site management versus the ones that didn't. Turned out that it didn't matter if they had on-site management. Those weren't really the problem either. It was the other smaller ones and the single family uh, homes that were the, the issue. And, um, and, and while we were looking at that, we uncovered all these other jurisdictions that had, especially college towns, that had this nuisance ordinances, various kinds of them. And uh, what I wanted to do is bring that back for a conversation about that. Uh, and it's not just about the behaviors, uh, that, and, but there are behaviors that need, to occur, that need to be dealt with that go, that are outside the social host ordinance. That's a specific uh, uh, criminal things that are, are being done, but there are other things and, and properties that are uh, uncared for, that are eyesores, that are abandoned. What do we do about those? And and really, what uh, these other nuisance ordinances have done is create accountability mechanisms, as we did with the social host ordinance that works is working great, by the way. Uh, that go beyond what we do now, which really isn't that much. Uh, our nuisance enforcement system is is uh, uh, pretty bare bones, and and also talk about how maybe community standards or neighborhood standards can impact that, and what neighbors can do to take on some of that accountability role uh, to 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 assess those livability issues, which is really where this comes from, as as, as Chris mentioned. Claire. So it looks like we're having a little mini work session after all. I was going to say, we're going to get a like takeaway from not having a work session. <laughs> this is a first. We're taking advantage of the opportunity. <laughs> so I just wanted to add to what other counselors have already said, that it's not just in residential areas. So mm -hmm. there, there was just an article in the paper recently about a particular property uh, right by my house that's on a major thoroughfare, 7th and Monroe, that has been derelict for a number of years and right now is a terrible, terrible eyesore. Uh, and I really fear that it's going to look like that for the next 10 years uh, with a big black tarp on the side of it. And I, I really, really hope that that is not allowed by our code. Um, so I think in addition to residential neighborhoods and the impacts that buildings being left abandoned have, I, I would want to learn about what our enforcement is for commercial and um, industrial sites that might also have a very negative impact on the surrounding neighborhood. Okay, so it sounds like, uh, in addition to what Rochelle has already prepared, uh, just a broader discussion about what we're really doing around code enforcement period. So kind of a 101, what's in the code, what we do, and then here's some places you could you could go with improvements. And what can we do? Yeah. I'd also um, ask you to think about uh, separating the two. <laughs> I Separate. think the, the issues that you were separate from the ones you were, that maybe we could have those discussions separately because I think once we get into the general nuisance category you're into a whole um, as you just observed a more than one a, a, a huge range of things and I think this is a little different than that, but that okay maybe you disagree I don't okay I'm just saying think about that well, it'll be the same people so I was trying to figure out if there was a way to okay I just I, that's okay that's we can okay. we'll find a way to separate the conversation so it makes sense and it's too big <laughs> yes that's what I was thinking okay, okay. Thank you all very much, and that'll be it for today. Thanks. We're back to the turkeys.